is 98 degrees hot outside when that's literally human body temperature. But right now, anybody who's watching this, including that young man, uh, uh, they're, they're living. You're a living human being, and that requires you to be, like, creating energy. You know, like, all the thinking you're doing burns a lot of calories, all of the, the heart beating and the breathing, and just the maintenance of this produces heat. And we need to shed that heat or we will overheat. So th this, is, this is the situation. We are surrounded by air molecules, and it is a best-case situation for us for there to be air molecules that are cooler than us so that they can warm up as they touch our skin and cool our skin down as they warm themselves up. If we can't shed our heat to our environment, all of the molecules, the enzymes that make our body function, they stop working, and you die. Oh, you looking for trouble. You looking for trouble, you wasted weed whacker. Hey, Hank Green, what's your favorite of the seven C's? The, the science fiction and fantasy section of my local bookstore. So if a resume already has everything in it, why does a company want a cover letter? The resume is giving a company like an overview snapshot of your experiences, what you've done before. A cover letter is not, is not the same thing. And now it's hard if you don't know, if, if there's like a low percentage chance of you getting a job, it's really hard to write a cover letter specific to the job. But if there's a higher percentage chance, writing a specific cover letter that shows um, that you understand the problems that the company faces and you understand how your specific set of uh, tools can help them solve that problem. And you can also express to some extent how excited you would be to use the toolkit you have, the you know all the useful skills that you have developed over the course of your life to apply to the company's problems and you're excited about that. That's what I'm looking for in a cover letter. Ah, this is so cool. You never, you never know what question's going to be the ridiculously cool one. Our blood is made in our bones because it's dark there. It's the darkest place in our bodies. This doesn't actually matter when you're our size because, like, sunlight cannot get too deep down into us. But when our ancestors, the first land animals, were coming out of the water, suddenly they had to deal with all this UV radiation that the water was previously blocking. And one thing UV radiation does is it really messes with blood stem cell production. Fish deal with this in a totally different way. They make their blood in their kidneys and they actually cover the tops of their kidneys with, like, a layer of melanocytes or, like, basically an, a cellular umbrella. But this appears to have not been enough for land animals. Animals, so we evolved to have blood production inside of our bones, the darkest place evolution could find. This information comes from research done in 2018. So like very new stuff. Like I wouldn't have been able to answer this question two years ago. That's awesome. Ah, this is so cool. You never, you never know what question is going to be the ridiculously cool one. Our blood is made in our bones because it's dark there. It's the darkest place in our bodies. This doesn't actually matter when you're our size because like sunlight cannot get too deep down into us. But when our ancestors, the first land animals, were coming out of the water, suddenly they had to deal with all this UV radiation that the water was previously blocking. And one thing UV radiation does is it really messes with blood stem cell production. Fish deal with this in a totally different way. They make their blood in their kidneys and they actually cover the tops of their kidneys with like a layer of melanocytes or like basically an, a cellular umbrella. But this appears to have not been enough for land Animals. So we evolved to have blood production inside of our bones, the darkest place evolution could find. This information comes from research done in 2018. So like very new stuff. Like I wouldn't have been able to answer this question two years ago. That's awesome. What would my body do with 20 billion calories? Like what would happen to my body? So many I different things to discuss here. I mean, obviously first don't eat uranium. You can get uranium, just not like the kind that you can make bombs out of. But don't eat it. Definitely don't eat it. That's the top of all the things I've said to not eat. Uranium is number one. Second, also as discussed on my account before, when we're talking about calories, in this circumstance, we're talking about the amount of heat it can produce. And this is 
undergoing fission, so the uranium is splitting apart. Some of that mass turning into energy, E equals mc squared, C being the speed of light, a very big number. So if you ate the uranium, those calories, like your body couldn't obviously like turn those into energy. But if you managed to eat a lot, like millions of calories in a day, your body actually couldn't process all of it. There's an amount it can store per hour of metabolism. It's a high amount though, so like don't, don't eat millions of calories. Tell me how I slept again, my memory is hazy. You're my favorite rapper now. Did you know that pelicans have three stomachs? And one of them's just for bones. What were electric eels called before electricity was invented? I'm going to do it every video. Well, first of all, electricity wasn't invented. It was discovered. Uh, it's a property of the universe and one that we've known about for a long time, since like BC times. So we actually discovered electricity before we discovered the electric eel. And I'm using the big air quotes around discovered the electric eel because the, it's really the we that we should be talking about here. Because when I say we discovered the electric eel, I mean like white people came along and started naming stuff. The electric eels are from South America, from the Amazon River Basin. And Carl Linnaeus found out about them and he named them, um, what is it? It's uh, G Gymnotus electricus. Uh, which is actually more accurate than the name electric eel because uh, electric eel, electric is correct. We got that part right. Eel, not right. They are not eels. So take that, white people naming things. I'm blowing bubbles with my son. Did the little ridges on the end of the bubble wand do anything? All right, three things. Number one, you don't have to say that it's with your son. We're allowed to blow bubbles as adults. It can be with or without your kid. You're fine. Second, we know for sure that there is a good reason for the ridges and that they hold on to bubble solution. So it just increases the surface area. When you dunk it in, more bubble stuff gets on there so you can blow bubbles for longer without having to redunk it and fill those ridges back up again. Number three, there's a potential second effect here that in addition to being able to hold on to more bubble solution there's just like a mechanical reason why a bubble is able to more effectively leave the wand when there's a bunch of ridges like it it like as it's leaving it can pull more bubble solution along with it and that means that they can it can like seal more effectively and the bubble will have more bubble solution in it and so it'll be a stronger bubble but this is a pretty hard thing to actually test an eyelash or a dog hair in your eye and you can't get it no one will tell you this but there's a, a pouch called the lacrimal sack and all your eyelashes go into there by the time you're an old person like me your lacrimal sack fills with eyelashes and then you just have to have a procedure and they don't tell you about this when you're young because it's gross and they suck all the eyelashes out of your lacrimal sack and they give them to you in a small vial. I have mine around here somewhere. Could you tell I was lying? Like at what point did you figure out I was lying? Because this is important. Just because someone in a position of authority is telling you something does not mean that they are always right. I will be wrong about stuff sometimes and sometimes I'll just be fucking with you. Anyway, they sometimes come out in your sleep and then when you like rub your sleep out of your eye, there's actually a bunch of eyelashes clumped in with all of this stuff but it does eventually come out one way or another